The Chiefs aren't just 4-0, they've also got an art collection. Plus a look at how the federal budget knife has made it harder than ever for local Head Start programs. A sneak peek at the dazzling new culinary center at Johnson County Community College and the lowdown on Cinema KC. It's all coming up on The Local Show. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Nick Haynes. Over the past few months, it's been really hard to keep track of which federal budget crisis to, well, keep track of. Perhaps the one that will end up having the deepest effect is the sequester. The sequester clipped almost everybody. The Air Force, NASA, the FBI. It also cost 57,000 low-income children slots in Head Start. We sent KCPT's special correspondent, Sam Zeff, to see how local Head Start programs are coping. Here are kids in a local Head Start program. We have a jellyfish play. Here's their teacher. This is a five-year-old boy from Lee Summit who should be in Head Start. <laughs> and this is his mom, who right now is struggling to pay for high-quality preschool. All of these are important elements to our story, but we probably wouldn't have a story to tell were it not for this. Five years ago this weekend, the unthinkable happened. A major U.S. investment bank, Lehman Brothers, collapsed, triggering Western capitalism's most serious crisis since the 1930s. This really marked the beginning of the Great Recession. Without the Great Recession, we would not have had the Budget Control Act of 2011. Without the Budget Control Act, there would be no sequester. And without the sequester, we wouldn't be in Diana Heck's living room right now. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to get a, an education. Diana moved to Lee's Summit with her three children, including Elijah here, who just turned five, a few months ago. Separated from her husband, she was literally banking on free Head Start classes for high-quality preschool for her youngest. Going into kindergarten, you need to have computer skills, you need to have, you know, your ABCs down, you need to have, you know, counting to 100, you need to have uh, social skills. But along came sequestration, and the Head Start program in Lee Summit was cut. In the Metro, sequestration cost 204 Head Start slots in Missouri and 84 in Kansas. Across both states, almost 2,200 poor children are no longer benefiting from everything Head Start has to offer. When you go out to our Head Start program, it's such a rich program. Uh, it provides not only that preschool experience for that young child, but their family, education, health, nutrition. It's so wide ranging. Here's something you didn't know about Head Start. All meals are served family style. For many of these preschoolers, this is the only time they will ever sit down at a table to eat. And here's something else you probably didn't know. Besides brushing their teeth to this catchy tune, Head Start students get basic dental and health care. The program also offers support to their entire family. So we work hard to put them in touch with any resources that might meet any needs that they have that come up, on top of providing social emotional skill-based practices and um, academics, of course, which we focus on to really try to get them on a parallel playing field when they get to kindergarten because there are some high demands these days when you get into the school system. And here's something else you may not have known. We have a growing poverty population, as uh, certainly do they do in the suburbs here in Johnson County. Um, our percentage of poverty has increased in the school district uh, over 26% last year. Uh, so we have students with many needs in this community. Dr. Allison Banikowski is deputy superintendent in the Olathe School District. 
where they have 149 Head Start students, but she says there's at least twice that number who qualify. Olathe, like all other Head Start programs in America, took a 5.27% cut in funding. Some programs laid off staff, some cut transportation, and some closed altogether. But Olathe was able to keep its 149 students when staff retired and wasn't replaced. If we continue to have budget reductions, uh, we know that sooner or later we're going to be looking at those student slots. Uh, so while we were saved at the moment and we were very creative uh, in how we uh, implemented that cut, uh, we know that in the long run it's, it could have some wide-ranging implications for the program. But it's not just less Head Start money districts are coping with right now. Sequestration has also been a cut in Title I funding, federal money aimed at helping disadvantaged students in math and reading. Banikowski says Olathe had leftover money from last year, so Title I was spared. Not so in the future. Too early for me to talk about exactly what we've decided, but all of them that we brainstormed as options were very sad options. They were cutting programs or cutting teachers, cutting staff, and those are all services to children who need it. So at a time of growing need, educators say money for poor children is being cut. It didn't enter my mind that there would be no Head Start. It simply did not enter my mind. Which leaves parents like Diana Heck to fend for themselves. Diana works full time but makes only eight fifty an hour. Instead of free Head Start, she says she spends $400 a month for Elijah's preschool. That's one entire paycheck. So she makes her own laundry detergent, and they'll all put on extra sweaters come winter. I mean, I don't even know how I'm going to afford school pictures for the kids. You know, I mean, that's kind of expensive. Um, a yearbook for my daughter, I'm not going to be able to afford that. Did it ever occur to you? that the, the, the craziness of, of Congress, that you have the Budget Control Act and then you have the sequester and then, and then somehow it all rolls downhill to you in Lee's summit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and it, it's affecting little kids, which is, again, that they're our future. They're our future. Now, just this week, Head Start officials from all around the country met in Washington to urge Congress to restore funding for the program. Few are optimistic that Congress will find the money. Now, we often hear how much high-quality filmmaking and animation activity is happening here in town, but for most of us, encountering a lot of it isn't always easy. Well, that's where Cinema KC comes in. Tonight at 10.30, KCPT will begin airing the locally made series, which has already been running for two seasons on a commercial TV station. Randy Mason sat down to learn more with Cinema KC's inquisitive hosts, Michelle Davidson and Erin McGrain. The filmmakers that make up Cinema KC must be awfully excited to have this kind of opportunity because for years and years we've heard that while Kansas City has a lot of activity, there's not been too much of a place to put it. Did you sense that right off the bat, that people really liked having that? Yeah, I think that's true. And, and I think it's not just the filmmakers that are excited about it, but the general public because a lot of people actually don't know how much film and TV is happening here. And there's a lot of it, and it's a, at a very high quality, so um, high level. And uh, so I think it's not just the filmmakers that are excited, but the, the public as well. It's exciting because so often we get excited to see our film on a big screen. It's a thrill to sit with the audience and they're reacting to it. But sometimes you don't get many people to come to the theater, you know, or even if you saw the theater, it's nothing like being able to broadcast to a wide audience in um, the TV world. So I think people are thrilled just to share their work with as many people as possible because they're so proud and should be. There's so much talent here. Especially in the short for, short films as well, you know, if it's not within the context of a film festival, that film might not get shown a lot. Mm -hmm. There's not an opportunity mm -hmm. to see it unless you're interested in going to film festivals and interested already in the film world. So this is reaching people that mm -hmm. aren't going to the film festivals but might get a chance to see their own film festival at home. Exactly. Is know. that the way you think of it when you're, you're interviewing these people, that there's their own film festival at home? You know, when you go to a film festival, I love 
attending film festivals. Yeah, and too. it's great because you get to meet the filmmaker mm -hmm. afterward and ask them questions. There's usually a Q&A, and that's kind of the fun part about attending film festivals. And we get to sit down with these amazing people after watching their film yeah. and ask them our questions. And we get help from um, all the producers and people involved in the show. But you always want to hear what happened on production or um, what were the actors like or how did you find your budget and all those things that, that I'm curious about mm -hmm. and I think the audience is too. Yeah. Is it even more rewarding because these are people that you've sort of maybe had some tangential connection with over time? Mm -hmm. I know both of you work in the industry and yet you get to see them get the spotlight for a change. Yeah, that's always great. It never seems like there's enough time. We always have more questions than we have time, almost always. It's fascinating to to get a peek into their process and mm -hmm. um, maybe someone we wor have worked with as a director, but to hear them talk about um, the inception of the story or how they began writing it or, you know, maybe that's something I wouldn't ask them if I was working with them as a director. So it's great to see things from all different sides. And we've met some really interesting filmmakers that I didn't even know anything about. Yeah. Uh, like nine-year-olds oh, yeah. <laughs> that are out it. making yeah. films in other countries and telling stories that are yeah. just so impactful. So this show for me has been a really great vehicle to meet some talent that I hadn't even heard about and we're pretty involved, I would yeah. say, in the film community. Yeah, I talk about up and coming. It doesn't get much more up and coming than nine-year-olds <laughs> making, you know, Are we all in trouble? Films. There's, there's nine-year-olds <laughs> yeah. bucking for our jobs here. Yeah. We pretty watch. much, yeah, pretty, pretty much. much. Watch out. Yeah, watch yeah talented too. So. <laughs> well, and, uh, what, what's the name of you names. I mean, you've, uh, animation, I know, is one of the things that yeah. Kansas City seems to be pretty big on. I, I think Bruce Brannett, for example, has been yeah. one of the featured people. Others come to mind that, that you know, you've really you know, watched, hit the airwaves and thought, what a, what a service we're doing to get these things out. Well, I think there's some of the big names like Bruce, obviously, and Patrick Gray, who are, you know, very established, well-known um, people in the film industry here. But I think there's some other people that have made um, films of passion for... I, for example, I think my favorite one this year was a film made by Barclay Martin and, Brian, and uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, Paul Pierce, and that was a documentary about their time in the Philippines, and that was really a film of passion, not from filmmakers, but from people who have a story to tell, from storytellers using film as the medium. So it's great to um, be able to represent that wide range of, of reasons people are making a film, so that's been a, a fun one for me this year. I think our very first show is with Bruce Brannett, and he's amazing. I mean, he's yeah. created work for yeah. Lost yeah. and Breaking Bad and has been nominated for national Emmys. Um, but there are a lot of really talented people that are creating kind of mind-blowing graphics just sitting in front of a computer. Um, and I don't know how they do it. I really don't. I still, you know, we ask them questions, they explain it, I'm, <laughs> it's still way over my head. But it also always goes back to story. And I think whether it's um, live action or animation, we are showing really great films that connect with people, that are about people, yeah. um, that maybe might change your life after you watch it. A five-minute film that you might look at the world differently after seeing it. So I think that's pretty powerful powerful in in the community in a sense that nobody's really making a lot of money off this project, I'm guessing. Cinema KC done for the love of it by a bunch of people who probably by now could have said, oh, enough's enough. You know? It's actually a 100% volunteer effort. Mm -hmm. That means every single person involved with the show from the production house um, to all the way to the host and all the guests, no one is being paid for it. It is absolutely a labor of love. And we have so much fun. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you're going to do something like for free, you might as well love it. <laughs> yeah. And we're like yeah. a little family, and we laugh on set, and it's not live. It's taped, thank goodness, because there yeah. are some times that Aaron and I have to be like, <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> let's go back, which is, which cool is kind of fun, yeah. yeah. And it gives our guests, because they're so used to being behind the camera. Yeah. This is their first chance. They're kind of sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, getting a little, you know, and then there they just is. warm up. And I think some of them might want to be actors after their experience. <laughs> they really loved it. They liked the spotlight, I think. Yeah. Well, somewhere I heard this is kind of an umbrella organization, the only mm -hmm. place where really it's, it's not some particular group's films. It's, it's pretty much for everyone, right? Yes, that's absolutely true. Everything from student film makes, makers all the way to, you know, Kansas City Women in Film mm -hmm. and Television and, er, and everything everything in between, whether it's professional organizations or um, it's, it's about the films. And so mm -hmm. we definitely um, welcome anyone who's making, making film. There are, a lot of, there, sorry, there are a lot of organizations that um, help emerging filmmakers, student mm. filmmakers like Real Spirit, which is very successful mm. in the Kansas City area that's encouraging uh, student filmmakers to tell their stories and, uh, um, and uh, express themselves through the visual medium. And so it's exciting to kind of bring everybody together and 
it is a, a film. It's, it's a show to celebrate filmmakers and um, not just one area of the film yeah. community. Yeah, not one special interest at all. There, there's no special interest. We're, we're interested in, in everybody's film. And our executive producers do a, a terrific job of, of um, you know, finding the films and selecting mm -hmm. the films. And, mm -hmm. and uh, what, you know, there's so many. We're already looking ahead at next season. There's already more this season than we could cover. It's amazing. Well, speaking of which, we should be self-promoting the fact that you've come over to public television. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Is that a good home? Yes. It's a perfect fit. Thrilled. I think it's perfect. We're so too. happy to be yeah. here. Yeah. Thanks Sp for having us. Yeah, you are most welcome. <laughs> uh, you know, with screen time, we've been able to show some people's documentaries, but often the shorts and, and things that, you know, little bits and pieces have been hard for us to find ways to get onto the air. So mm -hmm. we appreciate you packaging them up. They're going to be on Thursday nights at 1030, mm -hmm. starting October 3rd, right off the bat here. We get Cinema Casey on the air, and you're already planning season four, huh? You know, it's already in the works. Yeah. We love it. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really fun. I think every season we've gotten better mm -hmm. at um, making the show just more fun and more smooth. And, and um, so we're really excited about this season. We're super proud of it. We had fantastic guests. Mm -hmm. um, the production just couldn't have gone better really this year. So we're excited for people to see the new season. And I think the world of Aaron, so to get oh. to, next to sit next to her and yeah. hang out. We're, just, <laughs> we're friends yeah. So in real life. So it's so nice to go to work with your friend. Yeah. and. And, um, and the, the crew and producers, everyone's really amazing. And they, you know, they're working hard to spotlight these local filmmakers and, and uh, putting in lots of hours. Yes. Lots of hours. Many, but many I think hours. hopefully it'll pay off and all of your viewers will enjoy it. It gives them that chance to, yeah. to really see how much is going on here, which is what we try to do here on KCPT and particularly on the local show. So, Michelle Davidson. Erin McGrain, thanks so much for coming down and telling us about Cinema KC. Great to Thank see you. you. Thanks so much. A few days into October, and here are two surprising things about the Kansas City Chiefs. One, they're undefeated. And two, they've started an art collection. To help celebrate the team's 50 years in Kansas City, the Hunt family has introduced a program in which works by top flight regional artists are on display to the public at the stadium. We were so intrigued by the idea, in fact, that we've had our cameras at Arrowhead watching the progress for several months. During the design phase on the new Arrowhead, we talked about the possibility of doing this because we recognized that we were going to have some big open spaces, a lot of very large walls, and we didn't want to overdo it with uh, Chiefs-related theming. There's certainly some of that uh, on this level, but it gave us an opportunity to do something different. I think we recognize our limitations as a family, and I certainly have some siblings and my mother who have been great collectors of different uh, types of art, but because it was regionally focused, we recognize that we need to do add uh, some true experts. Experts like heavy hitters from the Nelson Atkins, Kemper Museum, and the Kansas City Art Institute. They, along with some prominent gallery owners, patrons of the arts and arts administrators, all gathered at Arrowhead's Tower Club to join Clark and Sharon Hunt for the official preseason unveiling of the first 11 pieces selected by the committee. A filter for us is the scale of the works. There's a lot of great art that's done on a very small scale, which is not where our focus is at this point in time. We started with the largest commission spaces first. That ended up being a focal point for us. We were able to say we're, we're going for these large paintings on these walls. One of those big paintings came from the hands of Phil Epps. He agreed that stadium walls are an unusual but effective place to see his work displayed. Well, it's kind of neat to walk and, and see the stadium from just a, you know, a few yards away here and see that big expanse of space. And since my painting deals with space and all that, actually the, the, the stadium <clears throat> was sort of a visual uh, inspiration in some ways. I created a piece that is very, very easily understood and a, provided a, uh, a very unique perspective that we all don't normally appreciate from underneath the bridge. I was doing my best to give them the best painting ever and also reminding us where we are from. I've been a lifelong Kansas City Chiefs fan. My dad used to take me to the old stadium and uh, sit, sit out in the rain under ponchos. 
the idea came to me to create something like an abstracted football shape. It more or less works out that way. Originally, Dirk Van Keppel planned for his piece to be all red. But at Sharon's suggestion, he added some white for contrast. The artist likes the results. And seeing it reminds him that pretty as glass may be, creating with it is always its own kind of workout. The uh, part I see, the rough and tumble part of blowing the glass, it's hot, it's hard, it hurts, it burns, it can make you frustrated, but you gotta hang in there, you gotta endeavor. That was really one of the neat things about the process is so many of them had a story uh, that tied to the Chiefs. And it could have been their parents bringing them as a child or being a lifelong fan, or uh, one of the artists rode uh, uh, horses on this property before the stadium was built. That was part of what we were trying to capture. Uh, this is a program to celebrate the artists from the region. Uh, so I, I'm glad to know that we have a number of them who are Chiefs fans. Dan, speaking of Chiefs fans, with the arrival of the home opener, the general public got its first chance to potentially see what's been installed around and above them at Gallery Arrowhead. Some people might not notice it right away. It may take them a couple of games before they see it. Jeez. We hope there'll, there'll be a lot of excitement, a lot of appreciation. I hope we do get suggestions. That would be terrific. Uh, we have a Hall of Honor downstairs where we remember the past great players of the Chiefs and a lot of the great moments in the team's history. And that's one of the things I really like best about game day is watching our fans experience that. And the art collection is going to be a lot like that as well. Clark Hunt may be a relative newcomer to owning a pro football franchise, but when it comes to answering questions about the art collection, or which ones he might favor, Clark sounds like a veteran. The entire collection is my favorite. There, there are so many great pieces. I was talking to Julian about that issue, and he said, you know, what I've noticed over time in my museum is my favorites change over time. As my perspective change, as uh, the pieces in the collection change and how they interplay with each other, there may be one that I, I like uh, this year, but it may not be uh, the same one that I like best next year. There will be more and more pieces joining the party out here. The process is expected to span several years, eventually delving further into assemblage and sculpture. After all, they have the room. We have acres, practically, upon which to put art. We have plaza space around the stadium to put sculptural elements in. This is a new direction, it's a new product that doesn't exist, and we're pretty excited about it, actually. Actually, we're pretty stoked. <laughs> the Hunt family appears to be ready to not only add an art collection to their stadium, but uh, the kind of quality team that Andy Reid can take to the Super Bowl. Go Chiefs! Go Chiefs! For the past year, KCPT has been partnering with broadcast students at Johnson County Community College on a joint reporting project tracking regional sustainability issues. We've tackled everything from the expanding infrastructure for electric vehicles in the metro to innovative mm -hmm. programs like Habitat Restore that's creatively finding new uses for what would have been old building construction waste. Check out the localshow.org for two brand new reports as our JCCC project takes you inside an area water treatment facility and to the Johnson County landfill where officials are being forced to take a serious look at environmental practices. We found a newspaper from March of 1972 that was intact. You could read the headlines. And then also we found a, a trash bag with green grass in it. Find those reports at thelocalshow.org. Now, speaking of Johnson County Community College, one of its most prized assets has been its culinary program, which has long been viewed as one of the best in the country. You know, it's graduated some of the city's top chefs as well as some prestigious names in the cooking world. Now they have a facility to match its reputation, a brand new $13.5 million academy which the head of the Kansas City Chefs Association recently described as so incredible, it's like walking on the deck of the Starship Enterprise. Well, on Sunday, you get a chance to see it for yourself, plus pay some of the students' creations during a free tour. But if you can't make it, KCPT's Dave Burkhart and Lindsay Fote got the sneak peek for you at the new space this week. 
First day of classes was on August 23rd, I think, this year. When, when they showed up, I think everybody was in, in awe and said, wow, this is really much nicer, much bigger than anybody expected. We have a total of seven kitchens, two uh, identical kitchens, and we call PC1, PC2, professional cooking one, professional cooking two. And then right next to it is the pastry shop. Go ahead and hit these with sugar anyway. We do baking, we do uh, pastries, we do confectionery arts. This class is dangerous, you know, all the great smells, so it's the baking, and well, all the cooking classes are dangerous. <laughs> This one down is our garde manger, we call that, and that's the cold food preparation. Anything to do with cold food. Then the restaurant kitchen is right behind you there. Uh, it actually will be our, one of our busiest kitchens. Uh, it's also the largest kitchen. And then the restaurant is right behind you, which seats 60 people. So they actually serve a customer. The theater, and I think, yeah, well, I think we all were extremely proud. We're obviously proud of the whole building, but that's pretty unique for us. You know, we really think that will give us opportunities to do demonstrations for students, for the chef's community, as well as for public. It's important, I think, for the public to know that this building, we can do things for the public, and especially events coming where we may bring in chefs, as I said, not only for the students, but also make that available for the public. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Johnson County Community College, John and Effie Spees Memorial Trust, Bank of America Trustee, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Commerce Bank Trustee, and KCPT members, thank you.